3, 2, 1. Hello, hello everybody. Welcome to this presentation from UN World Oceans Day Innovation for a Sustainable Ocean. Uh, we are very happy to have you here and we hope that you will be joining us minute by minute. Before we start with the presentation, there are two little things I would like to let you know because they are very important. First one, we are several people in different locations of the world so we might have a little bit of technical issues, we hope not, but apologies in advance if that happens. The second important thing is that we're going to do the presentation first. We are calculating around 40 minutes and after the presentation, we will be very happy to start the questions and answer sessions and we will do that through the chat so you can write the questions once we have finished the presentation. And now let me introduce myself. I am Clara Calatayut and I am the director of Mexico Azul Foundation. I am a marine biologist and shark researcher and today, together with the team of La Salle University and ai for f program by Microsoft, we will be telling you about our amazing project, Artificial Intelligence to Monitor Pelagic Sharks in the Mexican Pacific, also we call it Maco Shark ID. Before we start with the presentation, I will be doing a little bit of an introduction of the team members today. From La Salle University, we have here Samuel Soriano. Hello, Samuel. We also have here Carla Camacho. Francisco Lozada. Roberto Osorio and Rodrigo Estrada. From Microsoft uh, Philanthropist Lead, we will have Lupina Loperena who will not be attending live in this session, but she already sent us a video to be part of the presentation as well. From Mexico Azul, it will be myself, marine biologist, shark researcher, and as well, Francisco Mascarejo, Mascareño, project assistant, and marine biologist. Hello, Kiko. Would you like to tell us a little bit, a bit more about Mexico Azul mission? Yeah, for sure. Thank you for the introduction, Clara. So before we tell you about this amazing project, let us talk a bit about what Mexico Azul does. I'm just going to share my screen real quickly here. So Mexico Azul has the mission to preserve threatened marine habitats and species in Mexican waters through research, citizen science and education. We focus mainly on the protection of sharks, marine megafauna and the cooperation with fishing communities for a more conscious use of marine resources. Basically, we are the gap between science and the general public, and our vision is, and mission is to preserve marine biodiversity through citizen science, scientific tourism, and research in Mexican waters. So let us talk a bit about the programs that we at Mexico Azul do. First of all, we have two projects with fishing communities. Uh, the first one is this one, aquaculture for shark fishermen. Um, our goals here is to develop new livelihood options for them, such as a sustainable aquaculture land farms, and at the same time, reduce the impact of the shark fishing industry in Manzanillo, Colima in Mexico. With this project and with the communication with the fishermen, we were able to do this study about shark meat toxicity, where we, thanks to the fishermen, collected tissue samples from three different species of sharks and analyzed the concentrations of marine pollutants in them. This uh, particular study has already gave us some results and we're almost about to publish our first scientific papers about, about it. But, Today, we're going to talk about our main program, which is pelagic shark monitoring in Cabo San Lucas using a, a research platform uh, as methodology. So, Clara, why don't you tell us a little bit about this project? 
Of course. Uh, let me show you a little bit first. Um, we are doing this project, which is one of the biggest projects. It is focused on citizen science for shark conservation. So let's place ourselves. We are doing this in Cabo San Lucas, which is in Baja California Sur um, in Mexico. Uh, this is a very interesting area. As you can see here, this is the tip of the location. That's exactly the point that we, we are doing our study. Why Baja California Sur is such an interesting point for conservation, especially for sharks? Well, the Baja Peninsula, as you can see here, it is surrounded by two waters, by two mass uh, waters. One of them is the Pacific Ocean. The other one is the Gulf of California or the Sea of Cortez. There are different characteristics that, characteristics that make this point, Cabo San Lucas, this tip of Baja California, a very interesting point, almost a natural laboratory. And these are the influence of two important currents, the North Equatorial Current and the California Current coming from California. And also the Sea of Cortez, the Gulf of California, has a very specific bathymetry, like the bottom of the ocean is very sharp and there is a lot of like deepness and very interesting formations. That is what creating a high habitat variety. And also because these two important currents getting together in this top of the Baja California, we have high productivity. So if we put all of this together at the end of the day, the result of high variety of habitats, high productivity is biodiversity. So in the Sea of Cortez, you can find 30% of the whole marine mammals of the world and, more, and around 40 shark species, which is like 20% of the whole shark species of the world. But exactly in this area, that's why it's a perfect scenario for us to study pelagic shark species. As well, why did we decide to work with sharks? Why as a marine conservation NGO we are so focused on sharks? Well, you can see here in Mexico there is a map and we are pretty uh, great destination for shark tourism and shark interactions. We have Guadalupe Island with the great white shark, the whale sharks in La Paz, Cabo Pulmo as one of the most successful marine reserves in the world. Now the bull sharks are coming back. We have Cabo San Lucas where we are studying, Revilla Gijedo Islands, and in the Caribbean side as well, many, many options. So sharks are vital for the oceans. The problem is that from the 113 registered species of sharks in Mexico, there are only three of them protected by Mexican law. So there, is, there has been a drastic decline in pelagic sharks population worldwide in the whole world. So we have the responsibility to keep sharks alive. We need sharks for healthy oceans. So now that we know why Baja, why sharks, what did we find in Cabo San Lucas? Cabo San Lucas was quite an area that was pretty much not studied yet. No one expected to find these animals there. But then in 2017, we started working with our beloved partners, Cabo Shark Dive. With them, uh, we would be doing all of these tour operators and we could be able to go at sea almost daily to collect this data. Thanks to this combination of tourism and research, our NGO, we could afford to do this pelagic shark study, which could be very much expensive. But um, let's talk about how did we actually do this. After four years of like registering animals, we already have four identified species. We see before the blue shark, the silky shark, the mecha shark and the hammerhead. We recorded more than 700 shark sightings and we have more than 2000 hours of observation effort. This was done as well thanks to what we call citizen science. Here we have Miguel Angel Constantini, Jacob Brunetti, they are the founders of uh, Cabo Shark Dive and this is what they do. They take pictures of the sharks at every tour they organize, which is almost daily, except from now, which we are still not allowed to go at sea. Here you can see as well Mexi Mexico Azul team doing our 
kind of citizen science work. It's very important for us that we can reach out to the public and explain to the tourists that are participating that this experience is not only about a beautiful encounter with an earthly shark, but they are also helping us to preserve and conserve these animals. So we are giving a more conservation focus to this kind of activity. Um, I think that was, that was um, the main thing about the tourist platform, getting the research information for the tourist platform. But as I said before, we have seen four main species. So why did we decide to go for the Mako shark? And maybe for that we could, uh, let's, let's Kiko explain us why did we choose actually the Mako shark as our main focus species for this project, Kiko? Okay, so let's talk about a, a little bit of that. Let me just share my screen real quick. So as, so as Clara said, after four years with Cabo Shark Dive, with more than 15,000 pictures of each of the species, we were like, okay, what can we do? However, due to the difficulty and time-consuming process for us to organize, prepare the pictures, and actually do the photo ID, and potential software, we had to uh, choose one of the species to start the project. So that's why we this. So we decided to do the Mako shark. But why the Mako shark? First of all, um, first of all, it was recently listed as endangered by the IUCN Red List. Then it was also included recently in Appendix Two from CITES by a proposal of Mexico. Then after the blue shark, it's the most fish shark in the whole world. So it is highly vulnerable. And why is it highly vulnerable? Because of it, its life history traits. Uh, for example, long gestation periods, which take from 12 to 18 months, uh, they don't have a lot of babies. They only have like between six and 13 with an average of eight babies. They have, uh, they reproduce once every two or three years. And also females take a lot of time to be sexually mature. They take about 19 years. So with overfishing and these life history traits, the recovery time of their population is really low and they're really, really vulnerable to human activities. Also, as we said, their fish stocks, the Mako shark stocks globally are overfished, except for one particular, one in particular, which is the North Pacific stock. Coincidence, Mexico is in the North Pacific stock. So here is why Mexico is so important in the conservation of this particular species of shark. We have the last stable populations of Mako shark swimming in our waters, so it's our responsibility to protect them. So, um, so when we were working, Clara, what, what were the research questions that we had? Tu micrófono, Clara, por favor. Sorry. As Kiko was saying, we are working with the only healthy Mako shark population reservoir, so it's very important for us to do this job well. But of course, after working with so many Mako sharks, 2007 we saw the Mako sharks, 2018, 2019, we were wondering, like, well, so these Mako sharks, first of all, we didn't expect to see so many Makos in the area. That was something that Cabo Shark Dive kind of discovered and shared that, that, that information with us. But then we were trying to understand questions like, and let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. There we go. Like, um, are we seeing all the time the, the same Makos every year? The Mako I saw 2017, I'm going to see it again in 2018. We didn't know that. Um, how long do they stay near Baja? Do they just come over for like one or two weeks and they just go and keep on their migration up to California? 
Or is there a nursery area near Cabo? Because we have seen like big females and also like little baby mecha sharks. So we have a lot of questions and we were wondering like all of this mecha population, how can we understand more about it? Was then, uh, there we go. Was then when we were thinking, okay, so how could we solve all of these scientific questions? And then, of course, our first idea in our mind was to like tag the sharks, satellite tagging. Unfortunately, in Mexico pool, we didn't have the funds for that. Satellite tagging can be very expensive. But then after thinking a little bit, we were like, well, we cannot tag the sharks because we don't have the money, but we have a lot of pictures of mecha sharks during the last four years. This needs to be useful for something. And then as we thinking about the other sharks, like for example, the whale shark, you can introduce a picture and they will tell you if that animal exists on a database. We were thinking to a photo ID with all of the pictures that we have from the mecha sharks. And then that's when the biologists of Mexico Full had to start a very kind of complicated process. And please, Kiko, could you tell us how was the first steps for the manual photo ID process? Yeah, of course. So as Clara said, we started doing a manual photo ID. So what does this mean? Let me just. OK. So we started using like identifying the sharks individually, manually. This meant Clara or myself spending a ton of hours organizing picture, seeing pictures in order to, um, in order to, ah, uh, what happened? Wait. <laughs> there. So in order to identify them and since this sharks don't have any physical characteristic like recognizable like the whale shark or the sun tiger shark we started identifying by looking at scars bites hooks or fishing lines they have attached to their body or parasites amputations on the fins or any other notches on the fins or any other alteration like this one over here from the spine but it was like really really time consuming so by this time clara what happened that made this whole project come to life well at that same time it was back in 2018 november november 2018 more or less when mexico pool was organizing a very important oceans was there when I was uh, lucky enough to meet Samuel Soriano from La Salle University. He was listening to some of my presentations regarding citizen science and sharks, and he came to me and was like, Clara, in La Salle University, we have a great pool of computer engineer people, of students with a lot of potential. How could, how could we use technology, all of these students to help you, to help the ocean and to help sharks? So, after talking to Samuel, of course, you I have the pictures, you have the people and the brain that can do this. And then we decided to do a hackathon. So we organized like a bit of a, a little bit of a hackathon in the Sai University. Let me just show you a little bit about uh, how was this process. So we organized with the students a kind of competition so that they had to kind of program different options for the Mako Shark ID software. Uh, then we had several uh, teams, and nowadays this is the final team of LaSalle, which is going to develop the software. So once we got together with LaSalle, we had the biologists, we had the engineers, then we needed something else. We needed the technology help. And that's where Microsoft Philanthropies was super important part of the project. So thanks to this new component, Thanks to Microsoft, La Salle team was able to start developing the software as a reality. So from now on, we will handle the microphone to La Salle University team so they can tell us a little bit more about this amazing project for the Marco ID Shark uh, software. Hello, Samuel. Microphone, Sam. Yeah, there it is. 
Hello, Clara and hello, everyone. Uh, I am Samuel Soriano and I am part of the team that is development uh, Shark ID. So I will show you some slides that we have prepared for you to know about the project and also understand uh, in a better way why, why we are doing this. So let me share the screen. So first of all, Shark ID used train main, train main types of technology machine learning, computer vision, and artificial intelligence. And this is really, really important because these technologies are going to save a lot of the time to the marine biologists to process in all the data recollection that they have. So why is this so important? Because AI is a really new technology entering the conservation world. And this means that it's going to revolutionize all the processes that have been doing. Why? Because these technologies are going to save a lot of resources for the conservation programs and also a lot of time. And we can see that in these examples. For example, there are three main uh, conservation programs that are using AI and there are WildMe, Serengeti Snapshot and WildBook. They use um, data recollection and photo analysis to know what the species are in the ecosystems. And um, what this means, they have more days in the field and less in the office. So they can do more research in the fields for looking for shark, looking for jaguars, or looking for every species that they need. And also they can do a lot of analysis in the lab for looking for diseases and characteristics that have the, the species. Uh, now I will show you a video that talks about uh, Shark ID and what is uh, and what we are working on. Don't worry, Sam. These things happen when we are live. It's part yeah. of it. <laughs> Why is doesn't share sharing the video? There you go. There we go. Okay, so there is no sound. I don't know what happened that, but here we know we are seeing how is all the process, and we are seeing that it have machine learning and computer vision working on the software for identifying all the hammerheads and different types of sharks. Here is all the image correction. We have the unique mark that is the fin of the Mako shark because they are really difficult to identify. So we use the fin to identify them. So you can see all the image cleaning that we are making here. So we can uh, find the macro and also erase all the people or the fishes that are there. And then in the next part of the process, we need to make a binary imagery about this and have the fin outlet. So as you can see, there is the fin cleaning. They're making a binary image in white and black. And then we have the fin outline. That is that one in show in blue right now. So uh, the next part is that this fin outline is processed by the mathematical model made by Panchito. Uh, here is how it, we identify different uh, fin outlines. And now the project is working, is part of AI for Earth of Microsoft. That's a program that helps all the conservation programs. And now we are making a better work and uh, because we have more resources uh, for the project. So you can see all the process here, how we can find the shark, then the fin, then we make all the binary image, then we process it and then we identify. It. So right now I will handle the Microsoft, the, the microphone to Rodrigo so we can talk about the machine learning part. Okay, thanks, Sam. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Rodrigo Estrada, and I am in charge of, for the development of the first part of the of the project. So now let me share my screen. So you can see the presentation. Perfect. Okay. So this first part consists of the development of a program capable of identifying various species of sharks that can be found in the Baja California area. 
This stage uh, was performed with computer vision and machine learning algorithms like neural networks. Neural networks are one of the most popular models dedicated to artificial intelligence. With these models, we can approach various applications such as digit classification by hand, image recognition, forecasting financial time series, speech recognition, and many more. In this case, we have uh, used them for object detection and classification of images. This means, given an image of a shark, the computer will try to say if the object in the image is a shark and what species of shark it is. But how does this work? Okay, the first thing we did was to collect images of the different species of sharks to identify them. We collected a total of 300 images for each species of shark. We are using supervised learning. This means that at the beginning, we have to teach to the computer how a shark looks like. Therefore, after get all the images, a labeling was carried out for each species, indicating for each image where our target is and what species of shark it is. Once this is done, the ML model is trained. It is in this part where the computer tries to identify a shark. In the end, we have a model that is capable of identifying and locating a shark within an image and classifying it among these four species with which the model was trained. The project focused on the Mako shark, which does not have a characteristic that can be constructed easily to be able to make the identification. Therefore, we decided to use the dorsal fin, assuming that each shark has a different shape of fin. So, in the next step, another machine learning model was trained following the same steps as the first, but in this case, to identify the dorsal fin once the species has been successfully identified. So, right now, we are working on one of the most complex steps, which is to remove the sea floor from the image and extract only the fin outline. For this part, we are currently working on a new methodology where machine learning is being used again, but this time with a different approach. Now we are trying to implement image segmentation. Segmentation in the field of artificial vision is the process of dividing digital image into several parts or objects. Thus, in this case of the fin, with segmentation, we are dividing the image in several layers of depth, which could include in the first layer the background of the image, in the second layer some additional object that could be seen in the image, and in the third layer the shark fin. Once you have these three layers, only the fin is removed, therefore obtaining a binary image with the fin in white and the background in black. But as I said, we are still working on this new method, so now Roberto will talk about the current method that we are using for extracting the outline of the fin. Robert? Uh, we have some technical issues. Uh, Robert, the uh, laptop is not working well, so we are going to give it uh, one minute for him to reconnect to the live session. Uh, and if that doesn't happen, maybe uh, you, uh, Rodrigo, can talk, talk us about a little bit about the image correction. So give it one minute. Sure, no problem. Thanks. Improvisation. So that happens live. So well, until now, this is kind of a hard process for biologists like me and Kiko to understand. It is a very technical kind of process and it's been a pleasure for us working together with Samuel, Rodrigo, Roberto, Carla. It's, it's been very interesting, but we have been doing like trial and error. The software doesn't really work at the first day. We are still working on it. We still have many months to kind of improve it and of course we will have to like fit the software with as many pictures of mega sharks as possible that will increase the accuracy of the software at the end of the day one of the goals of the software is that this is going to be an open source it means that it would be online so everybody will be able to use it and it will be very similar to the software that already exists which is called the wildbook.org which is about the whale shark if you ever, if you ever find a whale shark in the ocean, you take a picture, go to this website, you introduce the picture, and the picture will tell you whether this whale shark has been already classified and identified, or is a new whale shark for the database, and, and therefore a new whale shark of the population for the marine biologists. So we are trying to do exactly the same process with, with the Mako shark. The Mako shark is much more complicated species to do this because as they were saying, there is no specific pattern coloration. There is like no changes of the, of the color between 
the guilt, like it can happen with the great white shark. So that was, and it still is, the biggest challenge to identify the Mako sharks by a photo ID progress. Let's okay. say as well that Mako shark, we have the short fin Mako shark, and the long fin Mako shark. We might not be able still or never to make a difference only with the photo ID. That will be a very big question at the end of the day. Samuel, are you already back with yeah. your... Perfect. Yeah, we go. have uh, Roberto online, so he can talk about Hello. the image correction. Hello, anybody can hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Roberto. Sure, thank you very much. I'm so sorry for the technical uh, complication. Hello, everybody. My name is Roberto Osorio de la Cruz. I am a mechatronics engineer and developer in this project called Shark ID. As part of this team, I work doing image correction, a process that is necessary to clean the photos that biologists and photographers take while they are working on the, on the field. This process has to remove all the unnecessary information from the image. Every photo will contain extra information or entities that we don't need to identify the shark and will make it much more difficult. These elements can be, for example, humans swimming with sharks, animals from different species like turtles, um, and also elements associated with light and water movement. But how does it work? An image, it's an array of pixels. Oh, everyone has its own information about colors. As you could see in the last step, once the computer knows what exactly it's a shark, the software cut the section from the photo where the animal appeared. After that, other trained model identify the fin and repeat the process Stopping this section from the image and focus only on the fin. We apply we apply different uh, image filters to every single photo to change the properties in pixels and to make it much more simple every time. Once the extra information are eliminated, we obtain a binary image of the fin that is much more easy to process by the algorithm that extracts the body of the fin. This L element is the key for the recognition software. This shape will work as fingerprint for sharks, making possible to obtaining the necessary information to identify them. There is an extra element that must be considered. Before sending the image to the next step uh, and to the next part of the process, this, and, and this problem is called copepods. Copepods are parasites that run over the body of the shark, covering different areas. As you can imagine, these parasites roam over the fin and can increase the error of the software. It's because of this that it's necessary to eliminate this information from the image and complete the blank spaces in the very way possible. Now that we have the border of the fin, it's time to take the image to the next step. And Francisco is the correct person to tell you about it. Thank you. Hi, I am Francisco Lozada. Um, I'm sharing my screen. Okay, um, I'm head of mathematical model. My job is to take the perfectly clean image that Rodrigo and Roberto processed. Now, as shown uh, in the third illustration, this is a binary image which has two channels, black and white. Then I find the edge of the dorsal fin in the image to work with a line. This border can be represented as a numerical matrix, zero if it is black and one if it is white. Well, the images come with different sizes and angles, so I transform them into a one by one square and spread them all over the figure. What is it for? If the photograph was taken at an angle, the thing can be concentrated up on one side, but with, with, with this process, we will no longer have that problem. Once the images were normalized, I fit a unique and unrepeatable equation for it for each shark with the help of an, of an artificial neural network. If the equation found equals another, then we find an image of an individual that we already knew. Uh, knew. If it doesn't match any equation, we can be happy with, because we have found a new individual. In the illustration, we can see multiple equations of, for indivi individuals. Please note that there are uh, four perfectly defined layers. Blue, 
black, green, and red. Each color represents the fins of different photographs of an individual. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carla, and I'm in charge of software infrastructure. First, I will share my screen. There you go. Tu micrófono, Carla, por favor. Okay, here we go. Sorry. Uh, before choosing our infrastructure, we have to make the documentation for the software. We review the requirements made by Mexico Azul, and with this, we create the use cases for each part of the software. The documentation was created in order to analyze and design the solution. This was necessary to get all the teams, developers, and, Mexi and Mexico Azul in the same page to know how the software is going to work, the different parts of to develop, to choose the best infrastructure, and the most important part to know that this was uh, the, this was really what Mexico Azul needed. Now, the infrastructure that we are going to use for the project consists of rela in a relational database and a web app. Uh, in, the, in the database, we are going to save all the information and the web app will be where all the processes start. We will be using cloud infrastructure. This means that the database and the web app will be hosted on Azure Cloud. This, this is the cloud service that Microsoft offers. So we already have explained all the different parts of this software, but how does it work as a software? First, you will upload a picture in the web app. This picture we analyze and we will select the shark, if the shark is a macro shark or not. After, after this process, we will clean the image and delete all the noise that it, it can be in the image. Then we will crop only the fin and and that will enter into the polynomial net network and pass to the final step. That is identify the shark. The result you will see it in the web app and it will save the information in the database. What are we going to do with all this information that we have saved in the database? Well, we can do a lot of things. Uh, in the web app, when you upload the picture, some questions will be asked, and all this information will help us to create a dashboard for, the sh for shark tracking. In this dashboard, we will be able to see the different places where the shark has been registered, the population of the shark in different places, how many times the, the same shark has been seen in the same place, and so the other things that, use, that are useful for biology. Of course, the main purpose of, of, of our software is to help biologists, and this is the, the reason uh, why we are creating this software. Uh, also, in the, in the web app, we, we will be able to get a report for biologists to have all this information concentrated and help with their tasks. Here is a plan for a Shark ID team. As you can see, we're in the middle of the trip, but we are confident that we are going to have a good result. Well, this is Shark ID project, and as I said before, our main goal is help biologists make their work easier, but also is the conservation of the oceans and species, because human beings have been, have been hurt them a lot. Oceans have always provided us with different env environmental services such as food, natural resources, objects, oxygen, tourism, and every beautiful beauty to inspire us. And for that, now we think that we must restore, return them the favor by taking care of them and making research on, on them to learn more and more. 
about our, our oceans and the species that live in them without hurting any of them. This is Shark ID. Well, thank you, Carla, and thank you to all of La Saida team. Uh, I think it's now turn to introduce virtually to the Microsoft part of the team is going to be a little video from Lupina Loperena Microsoft Philanthropies. Just let me share my screen once again and play this little video to finish the presentation. Hi. Thanks to Mexico Azul for inviting me to this important event. I'm very excited to be here, share with you the Microsoft commitment with environment, which is where we have started to work with Mexico Azul. And why Mexico Azul was the first organization Microsoft chose to work with. Mexico Azul was interesting for us because, first of all, they have an enormous commitment with the environment, the ocean, and nature itself. They work with people, creating a community by using pictures from different sources and integrating them into their database. We at Microsoft Within Philanthropies have a program named AI for Earth, which was created to empower organizations to support projects that use artificial intelligence to change the way people and organizations monitor, model, and manage Earth's natural system. I like to emphasize that to date we have awarded over 500 projects with 81 countries and we are committed to growing this community of grantees with Mexico Azul as the very first member in Mexico. Why was Mexico Azul a perfect candidate to be the first AI for Earth grantee in Mexico? They were looking for ways to do their labor in a large scale and with large impact. And there is where we can work with them with our cloud services Azure Compute Credit Grants. They can enhance their current impact. Then there we have a nonprofit with a commitment and data. Thanks to Mexico Azul for also being a communication channel across the sustainability communities. Bye bye. Goodbye, Lupina. Thank you for the video. It was great to have you all here for today. And I think we made it 40 minutes almost exactly. I'm pretty happy about that. And maybe we should start doing the questions uh, part. I don't know if we have any questions here. Um, mm -hmm. Should we start getting some questions from our assistants from the audience? Let me see. There we go. Are you guys seeing any questions? Well, it is. Yeah. Well, I'm going to read one question here. Uh, congratulations for the amazing work. Thank you very much. Uh, we're doing our best. And is it possible to replicate this process in other places? I'm in Brazil and it would be a dream to learn and work with you for the sharks here. I am. I kind of not really understanding the question. If, if there are Mexico sharks in Brazil and you find them, we can go with you, take pictures and use the software to make our database greater. If you have any question regarding this, uh, how we could cooperate with other Mexico sharks or even shark sightings in the world, please, we, you can write an email to us. Uh, maybe Mariana could write here contacto arroba mexicoazul.org, our email, so we can get uh, more information or these kind of questions from more people and we can get in touch from there. But of course, the idea is like this software, you can put a picture of a mega shark from any part of the world and the software is going to be like accumulating pictures and at the end of the day, we would like to know like, hey, the mega shark that was seen in Mexico now is apparently in Spain because we have another collaborator, Marco Paco Isaias Cruz, which is also a tour operator for sharks in the in in Spain, actually very far away from Mexico. But they also see mega sharks. So with this software, we would be able to compare if the mega sharks Isaias is seeing could be at some point the same ones that are visiting Mexico afterwards. Okay, so we have a lot actually right now. Oh. Uh, from Camila Haber, 
Thank you for the presentation. I am wondering how can it be applied to other shark species? Well, uh, I think that question can be answered by uh, Rodrigo because he is the part that is making to more sharks being part of shark edit. So Rodrigo, let's go, that's it, that one. Uh, sure. Uh, okay, perfect. Uh, how can be this applied to other sharks? Okay, I think the first the first thing that we need to do is analyze what are the main characteristics of the shark. What are that characteristics that can be contrasted easily to identify between other species? For example, in this case with the mako shark was one of the most complex because as I said, uh, we can't see a really a contrasted a characteristic like for example the um, the white shark, the sorry the whale shark which has like a lot of dots around all the body. So with all that, these dots, you can easily uh, take a photo and try to match a pattern, a specific pattern. And that pattern will be only for that uh, is, uh, whale shark. There will be another, there, there will be no more sharks that have that the same pattern. So with that, it's quite easy. But with the macro shark, you can see a specific pattern. So I think the first step is to identify what is the main characteristics of the shark. In this case, we are working with the fin outline. And yes, I mean, if it's working for the macro shark, maybe it will work for another type of shark with a problem. Okay. Thank you very much. We have another question. Are you planning to extend not only for shark, but more species? Well, two microphone, oh, okay. So um, other shark species, we no, but we have one before that, which says how long does it take to do the manually does the identification manually versus the software? Wow. So we don't have an answer for that right now, but for example, uh, it took us Clara and myself to identify 20 individuals almost what like a month, maybe a month and a half. And the software uh, could do that and more in a few hours. So, for example, let's let's have the Serengeti snapshot example that Samuel said. Uh, biologists, what what the software they were using, it took it 14 hours to get results. It would have take, taken 14 years to the biologists to process that many fo photos. So. Days, yes. years, right? Yeah, yes. actually that part is really easy because for example of all the 20 charts that Clara and Kiko sent us to us to analyze in the first test run, we have identified eight sharks of 10 and it was I think in one night I guess uh, because the model is really quickly and it's really, really time saving for all the marine biologists, bi biologists that are going to use Shark ID. No question. Also, so are you planning to extend not only for sharks, but more species? Not only for sharks, but more species. Well, we just work with, well, Kiko, go ahead. You know the answer. Sure. Well, as Clara was about to say, we right now we only work with sharks. <laughs> so our our goal is to, if we succeed with the Mako shark, we could apply the same process for the silky shark, the smooth hammerhead, the blue shark. But right now we don't plan on working on other animal groups because we are focused on shark conservation. But of course there is a lot of animals that have used this type of technologies like turtles, dolphins, whales, uh, jaguars, giraffes, zebra. zebras, but right now, no, we're not planning to extend to other animal groups. We have another yes. question, Paulina. ¿Cómo puede contribuir la sociedad al proyecto dirigido al tiburón maco? Well, that's a very good question and in English it could be how could how Paulina is asking how could society contribute 
to like this project of Mako? Well, the thing that we will be asking to everybody very soon is like to have more pictures of the Mako sharks. So the more pictures we have, the most accurate this software is going to work. So at some point from Mexico Azul, we will like launch a kind of a website or landing page where people can register their sightings and that will be very useful for the software to get it better and better every time. Okay. Siguiente pregunta, Anónimo, congratulations. Is your software is published as an open source so other experts can contribute to improve it? Well, okay, so right now okay. uh, it's private because we're still working on that. It's not finished at all, but in one point of all the process, there will be parts that will be open source and others because the license that we are using for making all the process, uh, MATLAB, especially there are not so open source so will we we will look in to find a way so maybe it's open source but we hope everything will be uh, open source and as well if other experts want to contribute with the project we are very open we have already talked to the to people who are working in similar softwares and of course we are happy to connect with uh, more researchers working in the same direction uh, at this time of the of the world, we have to work all together as much as we can. Next question okay. to Clara. What is, what is exactly the labor of the marine biologist in this project, a part of the photography and congratulations? <laughs> well, as biologists at the beginning, I mean, so it's like, that is born after three years of work. The biologists at the beginning, we were going to Baja, play like seeing the area and we didn't even know if we were going to find enough sharks in the area. Thanks to the collaboration with Cabo Shark Dive, we were able to be at sea every day. So the biologists, we were collecting data, not only the pictures, but oceanographic information, conditions of the ocean, a little bit of temperature, sex. We have a very specific data sheet for this kind of information. After three years, the work of the biologists is also training the crew so the crew of the boat of Cabo Shark Dive, when me and Kiko, the other biologists, are not on the boat, they are the ones who need to record basic information so we have a long-term monitoring. So we have been training them, telling them how we need the data. When someone is working with citizen science, when researchers are working with people which are not very used to record information as a scientist, it can be very challenging logistically. So it means the biologists were training the crew, collecting data, processing all the pictures. The pictures, they would come like in raw, in a very high quality file. Then Kiko and I would have to select them, which every shark tour, we would have 200 pictures that we have to filter. And as well, we also need to understand once the software is gonna start working, we also need to understand how is the macro population kind of uh, feeling in Baja California? Are we seeing juveniles, adults? So this is gonna help, help us to understand the dynamic of mako sharks when going through Baja California. So our conservation goal at the end of the day with this software is to detect whether Baja could be a key point for the mako shark population worldwide. Thank you, Clara. Another question, Jose Luis Funes, Mr. Funes, thank you for joining us. Uh, right. Congratulations, it's a great project for our Mako sharks. My question is, how's your view of the Mako fisheries after CITES, CITES inclusion? It's better be, it's better the situation or it's the same? Well, that's a very nice question. I would like to share that information. Maybe Kiko can add some more things. Uh, I think that was a very important point that the Mako shark got into CITES because it's the only population, healthy population of the world is the Northern Pacific population of Mako. And thanks to the proposal of Mexico, this species is in the appendix to of CITES. CITES is uh, conserva the Conservation International of Trading of Endangered Species. So this is going to help the Mako shark to don't be export like with no documentation showing that the like the this macro that they are trying to export is actually legal and it's coming from the healthy population. So CITES is already a very good step towards the conservation 
of MECO sharks. The only problem, and I think this is not only in Mexico, but worldwide, is that it's very hard for the authorities to identify like the sharks when they are about to be exported. It could be fins, it could be pieces of the shark. So because the identification of this specific site is shark species is not easy at all. Sometimes these rules, these international rules, cannot be totally accomplished. Isn't it, Kiko? What would you say? Mm, yeah, I I agree with what you're saying. And also, I think a lot of like the fishing authorities, I don't know if in other countries, but here in Mexico, I don't know if they're aware of how CITES works and what kind of permits they have to ask uh the people that are trying to export that species those species uh i don't i don't think they usually know which documentation they need to have to export those products so that's another thing about societies i think it should be more like a generalized knowledge and not a thing that only for example biologists or conservationists know about you know Hard question. Thank you, Jose yes. Luis. We, we know him. It's a pleasure having you around. Another question, maybe? Yes. yes. Thank you. Excellent pre presentation. How can we use AI to find animal diseases? Guys. So, we? yeah, we, we can answer that. <laughs> Don't worry. So in the last meeting that we have uh, last week, I think we were talking with another ONG that is called WhiteMe. They also are working with AI and they give us this amazing idea that the image error that Ro Roberto and Rodrigo are looking, there are all the parasites that you see in the presentation, they will be an Amazon indicator to find diseases in shark. So maybe we will find a way to implement that in shark ID so we can see the diseases that have the shark. But it's really cool because as Clara you, uh, said, marine biologists are really important in this part of the process because they see things that the engineers, we don't see because they know their animals. So it's really important. So they can also solve all the process for making the, the software. Thank you, Sam. We have another question. How will this be promoted? so you can get a bigger database of sharks around the world. Do you think that in the future more species will be added to the software? Before we answer that, let's um, let's join that with the next question because it basically asks the same, like if we're planning to expand the project to other shark species, other countries or other uh, conservationists. So let's join it. So, Clara, why don't you tell us about that a, a little bit? Well, um, as, as we said uh, during the presentation, we said that in Cabo we have uh, kind of registered four main species. The first one that we are working with is the Meco shark because it's like in extreme need of protection. So that was our main goal. But after the Meco shark, we also have the blue shark, the silky shark and the smooth hammerhead. So we are also trying to think that once this Meco shark ID is going to work, because it's going to work, we know, once this is going to be done, the software already can classify if the picture that we are sending is one or, or the other species. So our next goal, if we have the time and the resources and we still can manage, we would love to work with the blue shark because we think that it's also very endangered and we have seen some of the pictures. Kiko has already gone through a lot of blue shark pictures and we have already noticed that they have like little black spots, like little dots, and that would help us very easily for the manual uh, photo ID previous to the training of a new software for the blue shark. Would you like to add something, to Kiko, to the answer? Mm, no, I like think we should. Oh, uh, you would like to say Sorry. something? Clara, you got the little ones. Carla. Carla. Talking about infrastructure, infrastructure is that, uh, that that is the reason why we try to make a web page because we think that this is the uh, best uh, approach so everybody in all the world can join uh, and put all their images in the software. 
not only like Cabo Shark, if you have like, maybe not in this moment, but in the future, if this project grows, uh, everybody, like not only biologists, if they have like shark images, they can uh, put these uh, pictures in the software and get the shark ID. Uh, we think that this will be uh, friendly for everybody, not only biologists or developers, for everybody that can that want to use this software could be using this software in all the world, not only Mexico or Cabo. Around the world. Yes, actually it's like more or less iNaturalist where everyone can uh, upload photos of the sharks and people can join to the project in the future, not now because it's still in develop, but we hope that everyone around the world can join to the project of Shark ID. Okay, exactly. That's a part of the nice thing of the project, citizen science. Citizens from everywhere of the world can be part of the project just by feeding the software with pictures. And then we have a question about, well, Mariana, do you want to answer any specific question? Should we read something else? Um, Guadalupe is asking, nice project. How does it work to get data like size of the shark of mes or measurements? And in cases where the dorsal fin of the shark is hurt, does it recognize it anyway? Well, the first question, if we can make kind of a, a size estimation of the shark, not with this specific software. Not, not, nevertheless, there are other techniques, we actually use them. When we have our citizen science tours, when we do like a specific two or three weeks program for people coming and joining us and being part of Mexico Azul Shark Research Team, we are using a very easy, simple technique, which is like a GoPro and a kind of a structure with like two underwater lasers. And then when the shark passes by, we have a video and then you find you get a video with the shark with two dots. We know that there is a specific distance between the two dots because we calibrate the lasers with the camera. And then thanks to a software that is already uh, uh, working, we can extrapolate the length of the shark. So I would go to the computer and I would tell the, the picture, OK, OK, from here to here, I know it's 50 centimeters. How big is the whole shark? That would be something different. That would not be related to the photo ID that we are talking today uh, right now. And what was the other question that she did? Uh, about the thing, why we choose the thing. So maybe our team can answer that part. Yeah. But first, let me say to you that going to the thing was actually like the five option because we try <laughs> different techniques to approach that like uh, Lorenzini Ampolis in the uh, nose of the shark. We try to use the ratio between dorsal fins and the tail, uh, also the length of the shark, but we see that the dorsal fin stays really more or less the same in all the whole life of the shark. But Rodrigo and Francisco can tell you why we really, really, really choose the dorsal fin. So guys, the mic is yours. <laughs> Panchito, go ahead. OK, thank you. Um, if a dorsal fin is hurt, probably it could um, uh, modify the, the equation that, that I fit. But it uh, follows a, a path that is unique for every shark. So I think it, there is no problem with the allometric um, uh -huh. um, characteristics. Yeah, why we are using the entire thing. So if we, may, I don't know, maybe the shark uh, after a few years, a few months, uh, got hard in, uh, over the fin and just got a section, just got a section of the fin. Uh, we have the entire information of the fin. So maybe this, uh, this part that we don't have create a, a, a little, dip, uh, make it different from one uh, from normal function to another one, but not exactly, in, uh, not completely different. So the idea is that uh, our model be able to detect this little, uh, for different differences, and of course, it's trained to the uh, it's trained to determine how similar and how different are are one between each other. So the idea is uh, make it grown in order to make it uh, 
get more accuracy and as much images uh, that we got in our database, as much accuracy we'll get uh, this software. Maybe in this moment, because we're training with uh, with a short uh, database, it will not will not be possible to detect this or to make it with, with the correct accuracy. But after I don't know 200, uh, 400, 600 uh, photos, this kind of, uh, of differences, this kind of problems will make it will get uh, a solution by this problem. So the idea is try to get all the images that we that we could. Thank you so much. Uh, Valeria Magaña, it's for the Lasalle team. What have been the difficulties of making this software? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> all, all the process. I think the hardest part was finding information because Maca sharks, they look so similar between them that it's really, really hard to find first and uh, manual identification. Also, the image correction, you can ask Roberto and Rodrigo, it was really hard. And also the mathematical model, uh, Francisco can tell you it was a really hard task. Uh, right now, the web page that is making Carlita is also taking some really hard parts. So I don't know if you guys want to complement the answer, but I will see. I would say everything is really hard to do. I, I would like to say something, and it's also related to the next questions that I'm reading, and it's about are we, if the sharks are going to be growing year by year or they change parasites, is the software going to be able to still identify the sharks <laughs> even if they grow or they have new parasites? That's a very good yes. question that we will be able to answer for sure, maybe more in advance. But do you have a specific answer for this, Samuel? Because many people are asking for this. Yes, we. this is why well, we yes. choose the theme. Well, do you want to answer? Go on, Roberto. Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, have delay in my in my image. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Yes, we can hear you, Roberto. Last question, though. We have to go. Okay. So I will answer that one, and this is we choose the fin because that's the main characteristic. The fin doesn't change in the whole life of the shark. It's really a standard. You know, the shark maybe be two years. But the fin outline will be the same as he grow up, and then in five years he will have the same uh, fin outline. And this is we can answer with uh, security that yes, will be identifying the shark in the growing season on the whole life of the shark. Okay, so I think that's all from our part. Thank you very much to all of you. And uh, we wanted to tell you we have a virtual ocean race starting tomorrow from the 12th to the 15th. It's the ocean race that you can do from home. It's five kilometers. Please visit our Facebook and Instagram, Mexico Azul. And please, you can be part of this virtual race of five kilometers for the ocean. And this will help us the Sire team and the Mako Sharks. So please, that would be very great if you could actually register for our ocean race. Thank you very much for all being here, La Salle, Microsoft, even from the distance, Mariana that you're moderating, Suriel as well from Microsoft team, Pancho, Roberto, Rodrigo, Carla, Kiko, Francisco, and everybody. It was a pleasure, and we will be very happy to keep on asking your questions, maybe on an Instagram, co contact us on social media. We're going to be doing very much webinars from now on about sharks, marine conservation, citizen science, and technology for oceans. Thank you very much for being here, and if someone else wants to say something else before we go, be my guest. Thank yes, you for seeing you come. Sorry? Uh, go, go, go. So, I don't know. Yeah, thank you for being here and listening to our presentation and asking your questions. Every question was really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, for the whole team of La Salle, we shared you our heart because we know how much all the students in our university are supporting us. You don't know, it's crazy. So 
you can follow us in social media and we will be posting a little bit of the process that we have. It's always uh, the hashtag SharkID, so you can follow that hashtag. And now we are all in different countries, but next time we meet, and I'm telling you to all of the team, we're going to be in Cabo doing some shark interactions, the whole team. I can't wait for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Be great. Hey. Thank you. See you guys soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank we'll you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.